Hey, hello, fellow grand baggers. Um, I moved back to the dining room to give a little bit of a change again in the background. This kind of cool right picture there. If I sit like this, let's see if I do this. Yeah, got myself a lighthouse coming right out of the top of my head. <laughs> I closed the draperies to keep backlight out. Although backlight is a misnomer when you live in Pittsburgh, it's usually just back clouds. And uh, you know, what was it? When I was 18, I moved from Pittsburgh. And one of the reasons that I left is because it was always so dismal and, uh, well, I'm really depressing, aren't I? But of course, 40 years later, here I was back in Pittsburgh again, because love is the only reason that would make me move back. <laughs> uh, I have a wonderful wife. So I like sitting here in the dining room because this is the place where I get to enjoy so many meals that my lovely wife cooks. Okay, so we got to move on because <laughs> I tend to talk too much and get too long-winded, okay? So Grab Bag Series 3, Episode 5. We're looking at the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. And if you would, hit the button down there to say that uh, you're spending a little bit of time here, okay? When last we left Jesus, he had arrived about two miles southeast of Jerusalem in the vicinity of the village of Bethany. And Lazarus's sister Martha had met Jesus on the outskirts of the village with a statement slash accusation. If you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died. Now, besides a statement slash accusation, that, it's also an assumption, an assumption that Jesus would not have allowed anyone, especially someone he loved, to die. Well, Jesus takes that teaching moment to speak about his authority and power as the incarnate Son of God, because we learned from the last lesson that Jesus says to her, Mary, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? Martha says to Jesus that she believes that she has faith, which is stronger than belief, that she has faith that he is the Messiah. And John records in verse 28, after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside, and she said, the teacher is here and is asking for you. Now, that piqued my interest that Martha would refer to Jesus as, in the Greek, didaskalos, or teacher. She didn't even use the common word rabboni, which means rabbi. She called him specifically excuse me while I scratch my nose, specifically teacher. Well, some of you Bible students may recall a narrative in scripture in which Martha complains to Jesus about Mary not helping her with meal preparations in the kitchen when Jesus and his disciples and probably others had arrived uh, for a visit, for, I was going to say, for a group meeting, for a time when Jesus would teach. Rather than help Martha in the kitchen, Mary stayed in the room to hear Jesus teaching. And Jesus, when Martha accused Mary before Jesus, Jesus defended her decision, telling Martha that Mary was right to do so. Jesus was Mary's teacher. And maybe that's why she tells Mary that the teacher has arrived. Your teacher is here. And John records, when Mary heard this, verse 29, and by the way, I, I hope that you have your Bible with you. I always incorporate the scripture just right into what I'm right, uh, reading so that I don't, you know, spend a lot of time moving back and forth and shuffling things around. But I hope that you have a Bible with you. And when I go to read the scripture, I usually tell you what verse it is so that you can follow along. John eleven twenty nine. 29, when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
Sound familiar? When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And we can just assume that at that point, they went to the tomb and Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. <laughs> but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? You know, we wonder where Martha and Mary may have gotten their question about, you know, why were you here? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. It may have been a contagious negative attitude from everyone. You know, Jesus, Jesus healed the, the blind man, so couldn't he have healed Lazarus? Couldn't he have kept him from dying? It may have just been everyone's negative attitude. It may have been a negative attitude spread by Jesus' enemies. They were looking at any opportunity to undercut him. But I think it's interesting that some people looked and said, look how he loved him. And other people said, huh, couldn't he have kept him from dying? Couldn't he have healed him? <laughs> There's always glass half full, glass half empty. People looking at the positive side, people looking at the negative side. It's, it's part of life. But let's ask a question. What causes Jesus to cry? Well, I really believe it's a compilation of reasons. This is, I mean, the Bible doesn't say, but this is, these are some reasons that I came up with what would cause Jesus to cry. First of all, Mary was crying. The Bible doesn't say Martha was crying, interestingly enough. But Mary, his student, was right there at his feet crying. Secondly, the people with Mary were crying. Perhaps not all of it was genuine, since they did have an odd custom of professional paid mourners. <laughs> but if they were really good at their jobs, the wails of the pros and the wails of the mourners joined together would present a highly emotional atmosphere. Jesus is God, folks. But don't forget, Jesus is also human. And Jesus feels emotions, perhaps even more so since as a perfect human and as divine, he had great compassion for people. If you and I can feel compassion for others being flawed humans that we are, how much more emotion would the divine and perfect Son of God have felt? Seeing people broken up would affect Jesus very, very deeply, I believe. Verse 33 supports the idea that the crying or the weeping around Jesus weighed heavily on his spirit because there is a phrase used that is translated literally, he groaned in his spirit and troubled himself. The NIV says he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled but I like the way the literal translation is that he groaned in his spirit and troubled himself. I, I don't know if you have ever experienced grief to that level. The, you know, where you're so hurt, you, someone has died and you, or maybe even somebody has just left, walked out of your life. And there comes up from within you this moan, this wailing, this grieving that you don't even know where it came from. It's, it's so, what we say, deep inside us. It's, you know, it's an emotion that causes us to cry and to, to, to moan. I, I don't even, obviously, I have trouble even, I have felt it. But I have difficulty even describing it because it is an indescribable grieving, an indescribable emotion. And that is what the Bible says Jesus was feeling. It says that Jesus wept. Two little words, but I don't know they truly describe what was happening. Because Jesus, besides tears coming down his face, may have 
hunched shoulders. He, he may have moaned and grieved because he was so troubled. We would say Jesus was torn up inside. So that's what happened when he saw the people around him. He saw Mary mourning. It affected him as well. He had such deep compassion. Now, a third reason I think Jesus cried is because he would have been, as the Bible says, troubled. The word literally means agitated and stirred up. He would have been agitated and stirred up by what he knew from behind the scenes, so to speak. Let me explain what I mean. Jesus knew that Satan was at the heart of all of this death. All of this death from the beginning of time, from when Cain killed Abel. Satan was behind all of that. He was behind all of the grief, all of the hopelessness. And if anybody truly understood that, it would have been Jesus. The people didn't really understand all of that. But Jesus knew that life was never meant to be this way. And so he would suffer with those who suffer. And I, probably some of that came into the emotion that he was feeling. Why is it didn't have to be this way? And I think a fourth reason that Jesus would have cried is that, well, he knew that relatively soon he also would die. He would be placed on, in a tomb. And that the Mary who would weep most for him would not be Lazarus' sister Mary. It would be his mother, Mary. And it just may be that thinking about what was coming down the road in a very short time, the grief that would come to his own mom. You know, all of these things combined together. Mary's grieving, the people's grieving. It didn't have to be this way. Uh, my mother's going to have to go through this. Just all of these things together may have just came weighing in on Jesus with all of his compassion. And it just pulled out of him this deep, deep moaning and grieving. And it showed up in the tears coming from his eyes. I don't believe that we can truly imagine all that was stirring the heart and mind of Jesus, the Lord of life living in a world of death, a God-man who loved people as deeply as his father, a love that would result in the greatest sacrifice. Well, Jesus moves with the crowd to the tomb of Lazarus. And Lazarus and his family, I think we can surmise, are probably somewhat wealthy. First of all, they have a secured burial place. Secondly, many Jews had come from Jerusalem, the Bible says in verse 19, to console the family. Now, it was only two miles, but understand, they would have to walk in the heat down the mountainside, and they would have to walk, of course, two miles back up the mountainside, unless you live in Pittsburgh and you walk both ways uphill. Remember that old, anyway. So they had come from Jerusalem. Now, why would they come all the way from Jerusalem? So some people surmise that perhaps Lazarus had a business that involved contacts in the big city of Jerusalem, two miles from Bethany. He had made a lot of friends. And so upon his death, all these people came to console the family. Also, in the next chapter, chapter 12, which we're going to talk about in our next lesson, Mary Lazarus' sister will anoint Jesus' head and feet with a pound of pure nard, which was an import that came from northern India. And in order to get from northern India, especially a pound of this ointment, you had to have some means. Not only was it a pound of nard, but the Bible says it was kept in an alabaster jar. So if you have a pound of pure nard from northern India in an alabaster jar that you can keep somewhere in your house, that means that you have some other means by which to live. And so you put all these things together, you kind of get the idea that Lazarus and his sisters uh, were well off. They, you know, they were okay. They were doing okay. So Jesus moves to this tomb that Lazarus and Martha and Mary have. And all eyes are on him. 
and everybody says, look at how he loved him because they can feel his emotion. They can see his tears. And here is the Lord of life walking among the dead in their tombs. And Jesus takes control. And that's his right. After all, he's the one who has absolute authority. So Jesus takes control and he calls for the stone to be removed. <laughs> Martha, old Martha Stewart, the one most worried about propriety to the point that, that she just can't help herself, says to Jesus, Lord, <laughs> by this time, there's a bad odor. And he's been, de he's been dead for four days. A dead body in a hot climate without embalming would surely reek of decay. And Martha is right. But it, isn't it sad? It's somewhat sad to hear about a lady so caught up in appearances that she attempts to school Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God, but let me tell you the way it is. <laughs> I mean, Jesus knew the timeline. He knew about death and decay. She had just confessed to Jesus being the Messiah, the Son of God, but yet she could not control her urge to control. And so she protested to what Jesus ordered about taking the stone away from the entrance of the tomb. What if Jesus had agreed to her complaint? What if Jesus had said, you know, Martha, you're right. Well, Martha never would have seen her brother alive again. So before we get comfortable on the bandwagon of Martha criticism, let's offer some understanding to a sister who was enveloped in a lot of grief, her own, her sister's, her friends from as far away as Jerusalem, her neighbors. She's working hard through her grief to manage a funeral, to carry out her responsibilities as a sister, and may even be burdened by thinking about how things are going to change now that her brother has died. She's going to have to take on other responsibilities, or she and her sister have now been left alone in a society that is male-dominated. What are they going to do? There's a lot on Mary's mind and on her shoulders, or Martha's mind and on Martha's shoulders, especially if she has that personality of, I've got to control everything and make sure everything's okay. So Martha was probably speaking out of impulse and on autopilot. After all, this was an unprecedented situation. Open the tomb? Who does that? And who knew what Jesus was going to do? Was he going to just drag her bo brother's body out into the open? And what, isn't that like desecration of a grave? And if he was even brought back to life, what would he look like? What would he be like? Would he even be the brother they knew? Would he, or I'm sorry, we've heard of or personally known people who have had traumatic injuries and survived. And what do people say about them? Well, they just were never the same after that. You know, would a risen Lazarus be Lazarus? You know, that's just a bit of what may have been racing at top speed through Martha's mind. And this scenario, by the way, challenges us to look at ourselves because we too have confessed Jesus as Lord. And yet in our daily lives, We've questioned God, and we've had to depend on his grace and forgiveness to overlook our lack of faithing. So let's give Martha some of the same understanding. Jesus did. The heart of our compassionate Lord understood her turmoil, and he did not speak to her questioning his authority by using words that would further hurt or damage her. Excuse me. My nose gets, it's, it's so itchy. I don't know why. Maybe it's the mole on the end that's caused that. In verse 40, John writes, Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And when I read that verse, I kind of almost see Jesus smiling, almost excited. like like somebody who's going to give somebody a gift that they don't know they're going to get, and they're so excited about giving it. You know, Martha's questioning his authority. It's almost like Jesus is saying, 
oh, Martha, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you're going to see the glory of God? <laughs> you know, he's, I almost seem excited about what's about to happen. Because Jesus knows that this whole narrative is for God's glory. As painful as it is for everyone, even for Lazarus, who died and would one day have to die again, Martha, you are about to get what you hoped for and never thought possible, lady. <laughs> I told you that if you believed, you would see the glory and the power and the majesty of God manifested before your eyes. The miracle is about to unfold. But first, Jesus prays. 41, verse 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you will always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus prays out loud, and he prays out loud blatantly for a specific reason. Well, for two, actually. Number one, so that everyone knows that God is the source of the power for this miracle about to occur. And number two, so that they are aware this miracle attests that he is the son of God, that he is sent by God. He wants people to remember those two truths, that God is the power behind this miracle, and this miracle, number two, attests that I am the Son of God. He wants those ideas planted in the people's minds, and so he prays them out loud so that the crowd hears it. Even after these events have gone from front page news to back page news, Jesus wants them to remember those two truths, not the miracle itself, but the meaning and the purpose behind the miracle. Because that's from the beginning of John chapter 11, when Jesus said, this will be for the glory of God. So can you not feel the power of this drama? It was there at that graveyard. And I believe if I was there at the same time at that graveyard, I would have felt like every hair on my body was standing on end. I think the scene would have absolutely been electric. And when Jesus said this, John writes, he called in a loud voice, a voice loud enough to wake the dead. Lazarus, come out! Can you imagine? Every breath of every witness had to have been held. Every eye was focused like a laser on the front of that tomb. This was the moment. You know, one of the fads they have on TV, I've never watched the show, but I hear all about it, and I've seen little clips here and there, is this uh, masked singer. And when it gets down to the end, everybody in the audience chant, stands up and starts chanting, take it off, take it, not their clothes, but the mask that they are wearing. They want to know who is behind the mask. They are so focused. And, and the TV, of course, will play it up, and they'll have a commercial, and, they'll, and that obnoxious Nick Cannon will just keep chanting and talking and talking and talking until finally, you know, they take the mask off. I, I, that's kind of the way I see this. Lazarus, come out, and everybody is... <gasps> And they're all focused, and if they were out there, they might want to say, come on now, come on now, come on, <laughs> you know? And Lazarus comes out of the tomb. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. I don't know if you remember Fred Flintstone. <laughs> do you remember, if you do, Fred Flintstone, do you remember how he bowled? Okay, this big guy. Would get the wall and he would get up on his tippy toes and the music would tick, 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 as he went toward the aisle and threw the ball that's the way i in my cartoon brain whatever that's the way i see lazarus you know coming out of the tomb tick, 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 tick. he's wrapped in these grave clothes and he walks into the light of day and jesus said to the people around Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let him go. With Lazarus' appearance, 
Jesus proved that he is the resurrection. He has the power to make the dead rise up. And now with the orders to unbind Lazarus and let him go, he will also prove that he is the life. He has the power to sustain life once he raises the dead. Lazarus did not merely rise and stumble out, exhausted, and one breath away, you know, from dying again. In fact, in the next chapter, chapter 12, verse 2, John describes a scene back at the ranch, back at the house, so to speak, in the future when life has returned to some semblance of normal, where Martha, as usual, is hosting and serving a dinner while Lazarus is dining with Jesus and company. Now, <clears throat> Lazarus is alive. There is no decay. There is no sickness. There is no ill health. Lazarus is alive. Jesus is the resurrection, and Jesus is the life. Who did Martha and Mary get back from the dead? Not a weak, sickly, pasty brother they had seen suffer and die. Their brother was healed of his sickness, healed of the ravages of death and decay. He was truly alive. For the Lazarus family, Jesus was the resurrection and the life, the life that heals. The only downside of it all, well, for Lazarus, the clock began ticking once again that would bring him back to this tomb. But even then, it would only bring him back temporarily because once again, Jesus would meet him on the other side <laughs> of life and death. And Jesus would again be the resurrection and the life. And he would raise Lazarus and give him eternal life. Life like he never experienced it here on earth. And that's the same way that it will be for you and me, for every one of us who live and faith in Jesus while we're in this world. So here's a few quick thoughts in closing, okay? I'm probably talking too much, but I hope it's encouraging to you. I hope it gives you some different insight. Uh, you, you wouldn't believe the stuff that I cut out. <laughs> Um, a few thoughts in closing, okay? Number one, in our world, we hear that seeing is believing. But notice that Jesus recommends a different principle. He recommends believing is seeing. You just believe and you will see the power of God. Now, <clears throat> that's a good principle to follow spiritually. Don't follow it if you live in southwestern Pennsylvania, because believing is not seeing. I mean, you can believe the weatherman that there's going to be sun, but you'll never see it. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. We believe and we obey. And then we see the power of God. Faith has a component of obedience. Obedience is walking, though you may not see every step laid out in advance. God can be trusted. Jesus can be trusted. He's the resurrection and the life. Jesus asked Mary, do you believe that? And I think he asked us the same thing. Do you believe those, those truths about Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? That he is, as Mary confessed, the Messiah, the Son of God sent by the Father. If you really believe that, then how will that change your life for God's sake? I mean that in a nice way. How will that change your life for God's sake? Live by faith, and you will see the power of God in your life, now and for eternity. A second closing lesson, Jesus died. And the Bible says that God raised him from the dead. Jesus then ascended into heaven back to his original home. One day the Bible teaches Jesus will come again and the dead in Christ will rise from their graves and experience the new life that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That will be the great resurrection day that Martha spoke about to Jesus when she said, I believe that my brother will rise on the last day. That's a promise for you and for me. 
So let's be prepared for that day by living for Jesus now. Another lesson, a third lesson, Jesus has not diminished in his compassion for you just because he is presently with the Father. I believe that just as it did when Jesus was here on earth, suffering and death still breaks his heart. One day that will end, the suffering and the death. And even though we may not understand why Jesus doesn't stop it now, like the people who you know, said, couldn't he have healed Jesus? We may wonder, why doesn't he stop it now? It doesn't erase the fact that he still cares, that he still weeps. And so we have to live by faith, casting our cares on him until we see him face to face. A fourth lesson, how ridiculous would it have been if Lazarus had come out, looked around and said, you know, I liked it back in there. It was cool. It was dark. I was sleeping pretty good. I think I'll go back. Thanks, but no thanks. Well, that's quite absurd to think about. But what about those who have been set free and choose to once again wrap themselves in the grave clothes of sin? To cover their eyes, so to speak, with a death cloth and walk back into the darkness of the tomb of sin and death. Silly, right? But it happens. And you can read about what the Bible has to say concerning those folks in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, and Hebrews 10, 26 through 29. Here's just verse 29 of Hebrews 10. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. To have known the truth, and then to trample the blood of sanctification underneath their feet, and to go back into the tomb, into the death of sin. It's a tragic, tragic thing. Let's make sure that that's not us, that our questionings, that our doubts don't overwhelm us to the point that we stop walking by faith, even when we don't see by sight. So a final lesson is this. I challenge you to read the remainder of this 11th chapter and discover the reactions of others to Lazarus' resurrection. The Bible says that many believed. But still many others use it as an excuse to go after Jesus and even to go after Lazarus. Here was a miracle that proved that Jesus said that he was sent from God. But like Martha, the politicos saw Jesus and Lazarus as threats to their power and authority. That now then makes sense. Nope. Forget that. Okay, forget I said that. Let's start over. Many believe, but still many others use it as an excuse to go after Jesus and even ask after Lazarus. Here is a miracle that proves that Jesus was sent from God. But the politicos saw Jesus and Lazarus as threats to their power and authority. And so they, they missed the miracle to go after Jesus and Lazarus because of ego and the threat to their power and their position. They missed the point of the entire miracle. <sighs> Let's see. Satan twisted a miracle of God, something good, to bring harm to the one who did the good. And so, friends, don't be surprised by the trials that come your way. Jesus said they will come to us just as they did to him, even though we are trying to do good. So count it a privilege to suffer for the sake of Christ and just keep trusting, living, and faithing, faithing in the resurrection and the life, which is Jesus. Okay, I hope it's been an encouragement to you. Thank you for putting up with all my mistakes and uh, backtracking. I, I'm sorry that one of those came just right here at the end. But I hope you will be full of grace and overlook those things and allow God to use the scripture 
to encourage you, to challenge you, to cause you to think. And I look forward to the next time. Uh, it'll be episode six. And we'll finish up with John chapter 11 and look at the beginning of John chapter 12. Okay. Take care now. Here's that lighthouse. Still reminds me of what I said in the sermon two or three weeks ago, that we all have a choice. When your life is on the rocks, you can either be a lighthouse or you can be a shipwreck. Be a lighthouse. <laughs>